PEI for me is a place of safety, connection, family and community. Things are going to be quieter. Uh, people are going to be uh, friendlier. You get the beaches, you get wonderful ocean views and the seafood's amazing. The rolling hills, the greenness. It's just a pastoral beauty surrounded by an ocean wonderland. It's fantastic. Prince Edward Island. The Mi'kmaq call it land cradled in the waves, which is a fitting name for the small island province. Known as the birthplace of Kansas Confederation, PEI is the most densely populated province in the country, though the throngs of tourists surpass this during the summer months. You can see why. With endless beaches and lovely pastoral landscapes, PEI welcomes folks to visit and enjoy the island at a relaxing pace. And that's something I can certainly get used to. While hearing and vision loss may change how I travel, it won't stop me from experiencing the people and culture that makes this part of Canada so unique. I'm Alex Smythe, and this is Postcards from PEI. The ocean inspires drama. The scale, the sounds, and the impact it has on the shoreline. And a place like Thunder Cove certainly lives up to its dramatic name. Its forms are in stark contrast to the rolling dunes and the wide sandy beaches normally seen on the northern side of the island. Here, the water has uniquely carved each rocky form creating a sun-baked red Martian landscape of cliffs, columns, and caves, unique to this slice of the island. Breathing in the saltwater air got me thinking of a meal synonymous with the region, lobster. So I headed to Charlottetown's Lobster on the Wharf restaurant, where co-owner Rob Gale told me about the significance of the location. I don't think you could ask for a better location. It's a cool experience because there's actually a reading on a wharf and the history of the wharf, you know, is, is, is very storied. I mean, this is, they used to bring the lobster catches in on the wharf and, and uh, the, you know, and, and prepare them for market and all that stuff. So there's a long history of, of the, this activity down here. Uh, the business originally started back in 1964 is just really nothing more than maybe a baby barn uh, selling lobster to the locals and and the the owner uh, just evolved the business into a restaurant on the waterfront what what do you serve with your lobster dinner i uh, usually choice of sides it's typically potato salad and coleslaw are the favorites and that's usually what they go and they'll have a tea biscuit and and uh, and uh, of course the, the center of it all is the lobster i couldn't wait to try it for myself but it seemed criminal to not have someone accompany me for this classic maritime meal. So I invited Charlottetown resident Jeremy McDonald to pull up his wheelchair to my table and join me for a lobster feast. What did lobster suppers mean to you growing up? Did you have them quite often? Was it on special occasions or was it, you know, every other week? What I think tends to happen, uh, well, at least for me, it was a, it was a fairly rare thing. And I think for, depending on an, how much an islander enjoys lobster or the availability of it for them it tends to be a thing that might happen more on special occasions particularly meals like this uh, on the island you have people that are fanatical about it and they could eat it every other day you have people that can't stand it at all and then i think you have a number of us somewhere in the middle of that and that's where i would be have you noticed much change growing up in pei from when you were younger and how kind of Charlottetown and everything was to how it is today? Uh, yeah, and particularly in the last few years, I've noticed uh, it's kind of growing. And in terms of not only like the actual population, which is thankfully becoming more diverse over time as well with the, with the influx of newcomers and, and different groups of people, but also like our restaurant industry seems to be diversifying and growing. People are kind of realizing the, the untapped potential that's been here for a long time. Can you talk a bit about your experience as a wheelchair user, especially in like Charlottetown and in around PEI? Would you say that PEI is an accessible province or are there areas that, you know, they really need to improve on? Well, I think, I think we've made progress. I think there's been growth. Uh, I think there's still a, a ways to go particularly maybe in the more rural areas of the island, of course, where it might not always be a consideration. But one thing that I've found over time is that a lot of times if you raise an accessibility issue with a business, a restaurant, something like that, they will at least 
be receptive and willing to have that conversation about what they can do to make things better. Thankfully, with you know legislative initiatives like the Accessibility Act and, and different provincial acts that are coming into force trying to make different places across Canada more accessible, I think it's, it's a larger conversation that's being had more now. And I think maybe, you, you know, younger generations of disability advocates are more willing to be vocal about what they need and what's lacking. Uh, and we don't necessarily uh, shrink from that conversation anymore. And we're not afraid to, when we need to, demand uh, better accessibility. That change, which Jeremy is a part of, is something worth celebrating with a meal like this. So we pressed pause on our chat and dug into our lobster dinner. And it did not disappoint. Mm. It wouldn't be a special meal without some dessert. And on a summer's day, nothing beats ice cream. Which is exactly what they serve up at PEI's very own Cow's Dairy. Started in 1983, Cow's has spread across Canada serving up the very best in cold treats. But they haven't forgotten their maritime roots. Yeah, so I am eager to try some cow canut cream pie. Can I get a, a small cone of that, please? After the break, I hit the streets and get to know more about PEI's largest city, Charlottetown, when we return to postcards from PEI. Welcome back to Postcards from PEI. History has deep roots in this island province, and while small and unassuming, its capital Charlottetown played a key role in the formation of the country. The island's largest city played host to members from the Dominion of Canada and the other maritime provinces, who sought to explore the idea of confederacy. However, those initial meetings did not get off to a smooth start. Cameron MacDonald, tour guide and lead heritage player for the Confederation Center for the Arts, dressed in full period attire, fills me in on that fateful first meeting as we meet up in a park on a windy day. So they load up their steamship with the finest delegates, 17 liquid tons of champagne to impress the Maritimers, and they come right around here, in fact, in their steamship, the SS Queen Victoria and it's right around this present location where they would have moored their ship. And they would have waited, for it was incredibly rude in the Victorian era to land on an island without first being greeted and welcomed ashore. And they were waiting for the greeting party, which seemed to be absent. In fact, the entirety of the Charlottetown Harbor was empty. A, a very strange sight. The reason no one was here, the circus was in town. The first time the circus came to Charlottetown in 22 years, so everyone was uh, quite literally at the circus. What happened next is forever immortalized in the metal display overlooking the harbor, depicting Colonial Secretary William Henry Pope greeting the SS Victoria just off the shoreline. So he throws on his Sunday best, he tears down Great George Street, which at the time would have not been paved, red dirt soil. It's believed perhaps he fell down, as it's recorded, he had the island soil on his clothes by the time he got down here. And he realizes he's got a pretty big issue. There's no one here. No one to crew a ship and go out and, and greet the Canadians. Finally, he finds a little oyster boat. Seated in this oyster boat, the only man who did not think the circus was worth his time. A man whose name unfortunately has been lost to history, but in every text he is referred to as the Lusty Fisherman. I, I don't know why, but I'm certain he deserves this name. So without any other option, our colonial secretary gets in this oyster boat filled with pickled goods, molasses, shellfish, and a smelly lusty fisherman, and they row out to the grand SS Queen Victoria. The Canadians don't get off particularly well in this story either. Uh, they see this little oyster boat approaching, and they've been waiting for about three hours at this point. Before our colonial secretary can welcome them, the Canadians start shouting down. Ahoy, skippers! What's the price of shellfish? We're awfully hungry! An awkward first encounter, to which our colonial tech secretary takes his hat in hand and says, Welcome to the colony of Prince Edward Island. Please come ashore. A, a very awkward first encounter, to say the least. It's stories like this one that Cameron and his team of heritage players get to share with visitors, highlighting different parts of the city's distinctive past. 
It's easy to see his love of this city and passion really shine through the many wool layers of his costume. It's something that I am surrounded by every day, the history of this place. I'm also a ninth generation Islander, so my family's been here for quite some time. Uh, believe it or not, there was a time I thought the island was very boring and I couldn't think of any history that might intrigue me here. Uh, but once I started delving into the stories, I was proven very wrong. There is a rich history here, and not just with the Mi'kmaq First Nations, uh, but then the Acadian French, the Gaelic people from Ireland and Scotland and the English. There is a whole amount of history here, and it all kind of mixes and matches and blends in together on this small little island uh, that had some very unique history in the context of, of our Canadian history in whole. What's your favorite part about leading tours and seeing that uh, visitors and uh, guests are taking something new or uh, learning something that they didn't know about Charlottetown? It's one of my favorite things, honestly. Uh, giving these tours, it, it never gets old because of it. When people come here, uh, they are learning something new, almost always, and the best part for me is seeing people discover the island through themselves. It's like if you're showing a friend a movie that you love, and you're kind of watching your friend the more so than you're watching the movie because you know the movie so well and you get to see that reaction. That's what makes this special for me is, is reliving it through people over and over again. Cameron is certainly right that the history of the area is so rich and varied. While not everyone was aware about the fascinating anecdotes of PEI's past like the last duel on the island or the tale of two Colonel John Hamilton Greys, I'm sure that everyone would be aware of the connection between the province and its potatoes. With over 86,000 acres farmed each year, the island's largest crop deserves a place that pays homage to all things spud. Lucky for me, the Canadian Potato Museum has exactly what I'm looking for. And if the giant potato statue out front was any indication, I was in for a treat. Stanley MacDonald is a board member with the Canadian Potato Museum and his wealth of knowledge around all things potato was something to behold. Well, it's, it's a unique collection of potato equipment, information, history, which we've been very fortunate to collect over a period of years. And uh, of course, potatoes for Prince Edward Island are uh, uh, unique in the sense that we have a climate that's similar to the Andes Mountains where the potato began a few thousand years ago and that climate is typically warm days, cool nights. And of course, on top of that, we have a good soil. As Stanley mentioned, the 14,000 square feet museum has the world's largest collection of potato-related machinery, artifacts, and exhibits. And around each corner, there is something different to explore. Personally, I enjoyed the potato graveyard, highlighting the different diseases and factors that can impact the potato which is presented in several cute but slightly macabre potato-sized coffins. But there was also something else that caught my eye. One thing that I noticed when you walk into uh, the museum is there's also a restaurant here. Yes. Um, there, there's some kind of standard fare you would expect in, in the potato museum, a lot of potato dishes. But if I recall, there was something called the seaweed pie. What can you yeah. tell me about the seaweed pie? The seaweed pie. Well, that's a local, it's a special pie that includes some seaweed. It's different. Have you had it? Oh, yes. What does it taste like? Or is this something I'm just going to have to try myself and figure it out? Well, I, it tastes, in my opinion, it tastes nice. I like it. Uh, I think you should try it too. Mm -hmm. And our potato fudge, I mean, you've got to try potato fudge. Yeah, if you want to stop somebody in their tracks, you say, have you tried our potato fudge? <laughs> and that stops them, they say, potato fudge. I don't think I've ever heard tell it. What is it? What is it? Well, my stomach was starting to growl, and that restaurant sounded perfect. And following Stanley's advice, I knew exactly what to order. So I was told I had to come to the restaurant, try the potato fudge and the seaweed pie. So I got a, a beautiful plate of chocolate potato fudge in front of me and a bit of drizzle strawberry over top of the seaweed pie. I'm gonna start with the fudge first, see how it tastes. Mm. Oh wow. Mm. It's rich, tons of chocolate flavor, sweet, creamy. You know, if you didn't tell me this was made with potato, 
I'd have no idea. This is really good. Mm. Okay, the fudge is done. Now, time to try the pie. Got a nice little fork bowl here. I don't know how this is gonna taste. Okay, first impressions. Not bad, it, it tastes quite nice. It's very light, very sweet, delicate. Nice strawberry hit. Again, I wouldn't have known this was made with seaweed, which is a very weird thing for me to say, but I gotta try another bite just to make sure. I enjoyed my time getting a taste of the history here. But after the break, we go back further to learn about the island's first people when we return to postcards from PEI. We now return to postcards from PEI. Being surrounded by water, Prince Edward Island was forced to be self-reliant and independent. While ferries and water transportation were the main method for accessing the island for many years, the construction of the Confederation Bridge in 1997 led to a direct land connection for the island and mainland. Magnificent in scope and scale, the 12.9 kilometer bridge is the longest in Canada and the longest in the world to span frozen waters. Reaching a height of 60 meters above sea level, the large gaps between piers allows cruise ships to safely sail underneath. While the Confederation Bridge is an engineering marvel, it isn't the only bridge that connects to PEI. In Malapeak Bay, off the northwest coast of the island, there is another bridge, much smaller and much less known, but it's just as significant. This bridge is the land link between Lennox Island and PEI. Home to the Lennox Island First Nation, I wanted to learn about the Mi'kmaq culture of the region, so I crossed a bridge eager to explore. Okay, Gwei, Neen Delavisin Sagama, Darlene Bernard, Melkigana Kipawisk. Hello, and I am Chief Darlene Bernard, I'm Strong Eagle Woman. I am Chief of the Lennox Island First Nation here on Prince Edward Island, Abiguet. We want everyone to come to Lennox Island. When you come to PEI, Abiguet, you gotta come to Lennox Island. With that warm welcome from Chief Darlene, I was excited to explore all that Lennox Island had to offer. My first stop was to a fire pit, where I found Kelly getting things ready for a traditional way of making bannock, an unleavened bread that consists of flour, water, oil, and baking powder. Kelly, we're, we're outside. We got a bunch of supplies in front of us. What are we doing? We're going to make bannock in the sand. Um, first, I'm going to start making the bannock here on the picnic table. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll take the bannock and then we'll move it to the fire, where it will be cooked underneath the fire for about uh, an hour or so. And while that's cooking, we'll have oysters over the fire cooking as well. Oh, that sounds good. Once ready, Kelly brought the prepared bannock to the roaring fire. By making a hole in the hot sands and carefully dumping the flour all around the area, it will form an insulating shell for the bannock as it cooks. And this is one of the things we learned about cooking the bannock in the dough. Once the bannock is in place, Kelly covers it with more flour. Then. The sands of fire are placed back on top while it cooks below. While cooking, she placed oysters on a grill over the fire. Caught from the bay surrounding the island, they don't come any fresher than this. When they're cooked over a fire, it just tastes a whole lot better. Just the flavor from the smoke and the oyster itself is really, really different rather than being boiled. As the bannock finished cooking, Kelly removed the fire to reveal a black ball of dough and flour. After shaking off the sands, she proceeded to cut the hardened black outer shell to reveal a perfectly cooked bannock center. As we sat and enjoyed the delicious meal, I asked Kelly about the importance of sharing these traditions. It's good to bring the kids over and teach them about how bannock was made because um, it's reviving a, a tradition and I never got that when I was a young child myself, um, but to be able to break that cycle, to be able to allow to teach smaller children, to show them about how things were done um, with their great grandparents and how things would have been cooked. So it's basically oral tradition just 
brought down and just surviving through oral tradition, that's what kept uh, our way of life uh, still, still here. Keeping that knowledge alive is critical for the community. But experiences like this one also helps to draw visitors who want to learn about the culture. We did a lot of work on developing these experiences because that's what it's all about. Like people now, I think it's different when you travel, you want experiences. So when people come off of that bridge or fly in, I want them to know that this is Mi'kmaq territory. This is the Mi'kmaq. It's not Cree, it's not Innu, it's not Métis, it's Mi'kmaq. You're in Mi'kmaq. There is no mistaking Lennox Island for anywhere else. The island offers a number of cultural experiences for visitors to try so that they gain an understanding and appreciation for the Mi'kmaq culture here. Experiences like drum making, which I was lucky enough to try with Faith Myers, who gave me the rundown of what to expect. We soak the hides for 24 hours in advance, and then once the hides are soaked, we are going to punch the holes in them. So we're going to have eight hole punches. Um, it's kind of like eight pizza slices when it all comes together is what we want. And then we use the um, wooden frame. It's a circular frame, and we're going to put that into the middle of the hide. And the lacing, which is also deer hide, we're just going to work like from across from each other. So you will put it in one side and then come out the other, and then it keeps going diagonally around. It looks like really messy when you first have it like all strung together. It looks messy, and everyone's like, oh, I don't think that this is how it's supposed to look. But once you wrap it around and pull the, pull it together, it looks amazing, and I think the people are pretty shocked every time. Well, that sounded straightforward enough. So we made our way out back to get started, with the first step being stretching the leather strap. You're wanting to pull tight, but not too tight that it snaps. Right, right, that's fair. Okay, and just kind of working through. Stretch. Stretch. I'm getting my workout in today. Yeah. <laughs> While the strap was ready to go, we had to work quickly to hammer in the holes and wrap the hide around the wood ring before the hide dried up and became stiff. And I feel this is probably a bit of a race against the clock, is it? Yeah. <laughs> Faith's nervous laugh confirmed my suspicions, but we made good progress. Once the drum was sufficiently wrapped around the wooden frame, it was time to make the handhold and finish it off. So now here's the cool part is when it gets all pulled together. Mm -hmm. So what we do for that is we bring um, this lacing directly across from where we started. Sure. And pull it towards you. Oh, wow. Yeah, you make a perfect like star all the the different straps and the different locations just line up together. That's beautiful. Faith was definitely right about how everything comes together when she pulls the strap tight for the handhold. While I greatly enjoyed learning about the culture and traditional experiences, you get the sense that the community here is building itself up to have a strong future. And Darlene says that's no accident. Right now, like the work that I feel like I'm doing is very much foundational. I feel like I do foundational work because I'm just trying to build the thing so that the future leaders, you know, can come in and then just carry on the vision. We had to bring back all of the uh, artisans and bring back those art pieces, bring back those traditional ways and teach our people and kind because like all of that was lost to the Mi'kmaq people because of colonization. So we're bringing all of this back, we're, we're revitalizing our language, and we want people to come here. We, we want to welcome people, and we want to learn about you, but we also want you to learn something about us. After the break, I explore some of the island's more offbeat experiences when we return to postcards from PEI. We now return to postcards from PEI. Prince Edward Island may be small, but there's no shortage of culture and distinctive personality that makes this sliver of land so unique. Acadian culture is the perfect example of this. With roots in French settlements dating back hundreds of years, a strong connection still exists today. And while you can find various examples of the Acadian culture throughout the island, I was interested in a place that stood apart from the rest. The glass bottle houses of Cape Egmont are a colorful mosaic of green, brown, and clear bottles held together with concrete and form three distinctive buildings surrounded by a garden oasis. The fever dream of Edward Arsenault, this site has become a tourist destination for decades. I met with Angie Cormier, co-owner of the bottle houses, 
to learn more about this whimsical place. That's the amazing thing. Like when when you walk around and you look, it all they all have patterns by color, by bottle size and type, and then there's windows, and then there's like the angle of the walls, and you think, where did he come up with that? And he imagined all that, right? Yeah. And he did that, and uh, it, it, it's I find this amazing. And also, when you're building a house out of bottles and cement, it's not like building a regular house. Like you can't put up one wall and then the next wall. So everything was laid out bottle by bottle, line by line for each wall, right? And then when one wall was done, we'd do another one because you, um, you, you couldn't just put up a wall and then stand it up. And so what space are we in right now? This is the tavern, okay. ou la taverne in good uh, Acadien. Uh, we have three buildings and this is the, the, the second one he built. And we have a, a Green Gables bottle house, which is like a home, and then the chapel. So we say it's like a good Acadian village. You know, you pray, you play, and you stay. <laughs> there's, three, there's always those types of uh, buildings or areas in a, in a little village, right? It was truly serene to walk along the garden path and over the bridge. The eclectic nature of the houses, coupled with the garden decor of teacups hanging in trees, miniature houses for fairies, and archways to nowhere, you get the clear sense that this place was meant to inspire joy and creativity. And it has certainly succeeded. They just cannot believe the creativity, the imagination. And then I have people who know bottles and they'll say, do you know that you have this really rare <laughs> type of bottle or jar? And there's bottles from all over the world. And I still have people today bring bottles and they'll say, oh, I found this. Yeah was digging or in a junkyard or trash or traveled somewhere, do you, can I give it to you? I was like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it was truly a strange sight to find these houses and gardens nestled amongst farmland and shoreline. Angie mentioned that Acadians and Islanders overall had close ties to the land. And that was a relationship I wanted to learn more about. So I met up with Nancy Sanderson from Hope River Farms for a hands-on farming experience and she explained what that would entail. Well, we're gonna do some chores, our morning chores. So we feed and water and move any animals that require it. And what animals am I going to be encountering this morning? Well, we've got some pigs, okay. two groups of pigs that we're going to be feeding and watering. We've got an assortment of chickens, large, small, and egg layers. And there's some baby turkeys and a collection of sheep. I gotta ask you, how did you manage to pull this off? So normally farming is always hard, physical labor, and you know, you couldn't pay some people to, to do farming. Yet you get people to pay you to come and try farming. I mean, that's a pretty sweet gig. Yeah, I know. The, the locals thought I was bonkers <laughs> in the beginning. But really, I thought of it from the perspective of, say, a family in the city. Maybe they live in a small apartment, a high rise somewhere they rarely get out into open space, let alone onto a farm. So what a unique opportunity to come and actually be the farmer, not just go to a petting zoo and pet something, but actually feed it and learn about it and get involved. I thought that was a more immersive experience and be more fun. We were off with our first job being feeding the pigs. With two large buckets of pellets, the three 150 pound pigs didn't waste any time chowing down on their breakfast. So how much do they eat on any given day? I mean. We got two buckets here full of feed. Is, is that every day that they're getting that, that amount? That's twice a day they're getting that amount. So these pigs uh, take five pounds of grain yeah. for every pound that they gain. Okay. So they go from roughly 30 pounds when they get them to yep. 400 yep. at finish. So three little pigs takes a lot of feed. <laughs> they're not little pigs for much longer not once you get them. Not for much longer, no, that's right. <laughs> We then passed her hay fields as we moved on to her herd of 50 sheep, which were hidden at first in the tall grasses and trees, but quickly came running when Nancy called for them. Bring your baby. Hey, girls. Uh, hey, girls. And now they're coming. Now we got them. Come on, <laughs> ladies. Like the pigs before them, they were happy to enjoy a meal. While it was a hot and sunny day, experiencing the chores firsthand had me wondering about a future in agriculture. But before I did anything crazy, I wanted to find out why the island is such a great place for farming. 
Well, the climate's fantastic. When I moved here from Saskatchewan, it was like utopia. It was so <laughs> nice long season. Get all the beautiful rolling hills and the countryside. And it's just a pastoral beauty surrounded by an ocean wonderland. It's fantastic. Fantastic indeed. But before I could kick back and call it a day, we had to check in with the chickens for one last chore. Nancy, we're in a new spot. We got new guests in front of us. There are a pen full of chickens. Uh, what are we doing here? So these need to be fed okay. and watered. Okay. And because they're stuck in a small pen, we have to move the entire pen to get them onto clean ground. Okay, so what's the first step in doing that? Well, first we have to take everything that's in there out because we're gonna roll the entire pen on a set of wheels mm -hmm. and we can't roll over all their furniture. So we'll okay. move everything out and then we can move them. Nancy's passion for farming and her animals was evident. And the celebration and respect for the natural world was something that I have witnessed a lot during my time on the island. I wanted to explore that connection even further. So I made my way to the outskirts of Charlottetown to meet Peter McMurchie to learn about the ancient sport of falconry. Sitting in his backyard, we were joined by a special guest, a foot-long jeer falcon named Mr. G who sat quietly on his perch between us. Mr. G is an average male falcon. His weight today in grams is about 850 grams. He is a silver phased or a gray phased jeer falcon, meaning that he has a, a silver and gray back plumage on his wings and his back and his shoulders and his head. And then he has a white chest with some speckling along his legs. Falconry itself is about as far as we know, 6,500 years old. And it did start in Mongolia, and it was started with eagles. And so we've progressed from eagles to many of the falcon and hawk species today. And we've kept the sport alive that way. There's no school, there's nowhere to learn this, there's no book you're gonna pick up that's gonna teach you to be a falconer. It is taught from master to apprentice, and it has been done that like that since time immemorial, which makes it a very interesting sport. It makes it unique to have the knowledge I am learning and teaching today passed down for millennia and that that knowledge continues to be passed down and continue to keep this alive, this very old sport. While stunning, I was not going to be flying Mr. G. Instead, I would be working with a Harris Hawk named Athena. Peter took me to a field where I could get an up-close look at her before we started. So she, she's a stunning bird. She is a, a, a dark brown, chocolate brown bird with these beautiful chestnut red shoulders. She has nice long legs that are bare, unlike many hawks that have feathers almost all the way down to their feet. She has no feathers all the way up to her knee. And then she has a beautiful chocolate brown tail with a white stripe right at the tip, a beautiful white tipped tail and a white rump that you can see from underneath. And that's where she gets her Latin name, Parabuto unisinctus, like a hawk with a girdle. She has a beautiful big beak, beautiful brown eyes. And as she ages, the most interesting thing is her eyes will get lighter. And so they'll go almost almond colored near amber by the time she's in her 15 or 20 years of age. After a few tips for keeping safe, including keeping my gloved hand away from my face, it was time to see if Athena would fly to me when called. Placing a small amount of meat on the glove and holding my hand out wide, Athena rushed in for the meal. And then again, look over your shoulder. She's up in the tree. Yeah. We're going to make sure we have her attention. Athena! Athena! And now put your arm up nice and high. Athena, here! And here she comes. Watch the bird. She's much prettier than I am. <laughs> it's a beautiful symmetry between the bird and handler, a partnership built on trust and respect. And as Athena swoops down from her perch and towards Peter, you can tell this has been something years in the making. My, my hope is that people leave with a slightly better understanding of the birds of prey that I fly, of birds of prey in general, and of nature in general. Hopefully remove some of that, that mystical unknown that people might have to better understand the raptors that they see in their yard. After the exhilarating time I had with Athena, I am in need of something a little slower paced. PEI is known as a destination for golfing, so maybe it's time I take a swing at that. When we return, the postcards from PEI. Welcome back to Postcards from PEI. 
PEI's Rolling Pastoral Landscapes welcomes one to take a stroll or enjoyable ride. So perhaps it's no surprise that the island hosts more golf courses than anywhere else in the country. We have a lot of coastal views, we have a lot of rolling hills, we have some simple courses like this that are in, right in a city center. Um, so it, it kind of depends on where you want to go on the island, but there's, there's definitely a lot of options. Executive Director for Golf PEI, Sam McPhail, brought me to a particular course to hit the green and learn how to golf. Right now we're at uh, Belvedere Golf Club. Um, it's, it's located in Charlottetown, PEI, um, just off of Greensview Drive. Um, it's one of the older courses in Prince Edward Island. It was founded in 1902, and as you can see behind us, there's plenty of, plenty of golfers around. So this is going to be my first time hitting the green and golfing. Who am I going to be meeting to give me a few helpful tips? Uh, you'll be joining uh, myself and uh, Belvedere's head pro, Jamie Moran. Jamie's a, a class act of a teacher, and uh, he's excited to show you the way. Awesome. Now, do you have any tips for me before I, I take my, my first swing? Uh, the biggest thing would be patient. Okay. It can be a very frustrating game. Uh, whether you're a beginner or whether you've been someone playing your whole life, uh, it requires extreme patience. Um, and to know that every hole is a new hole. You can't, you can't uh, look back on what you might have done because there's another hole to come. Well, I was keen to meet Jamie and put my patience to the test. Jamie, we're on hole number four. Uh, this is my my first time being out on a course like this. Thank you so much for joining me. No, we're excited to have you and what a place to do it here in Prince Edward Island. Uh, you mentioned that you've hit some on the driving range before but never on the course. So let's let's hit one and see what you got, see if we can help you hit it even better. Whereabouts is the hole? Is it straight down? It's, Where should I be? We're going to go straight away first. It'll curve a little right for the second shot, but we're just going to aim straight away here to get started. Perfect. OK, get ready for the shot. Oof. Hopefully I don't screw this one up. Uh, that was just to test out the club. Now for the real swing. Two little things. First one is we're going to move the ball a little bit more closer to your front foot. Okay. Okay. Second of all, when we swing, we're going to work really hard to see if we can get a little bit more weight onto our front side so we can okay. finish a little bit better balance. We were kind of tipping over a little bit. Sure. Let's see if we can try another one, see if we can finish a little bit better balance. Let's see how we do. Okay. So, uh, have it a bit closer to my front foot, you said? Yeah and have it a bit more pressure on the front side. Just when you finish. So start 50-50, okay. but see when you're done, if we can finish a little bit more on our front foot. Okay. Wow, well done. Thank you, you, thank you. Next lesson, a chip onto the green with a seven iron. I see the, the green out there, uh, so how should I be approaching the shot? Um, now we're gonna have the ball in the middle of our stance. Okay. Um, we hit a great drive here. Yep. Some of the swings we took back there were a little bit more on the violent side, okay, so we're going to okay. try and finish a little bit more relaxed, a little bit sure. more in balance. Okay. Let's see how we do. Okay. Well, here we go. Okay. Right. Well struck. Thank you. And finally, a 12-foot putt on the green. Now, I noticed on the putter there's a couple of lines. What are those for? Um, two reasons. One is to help you aim the putter in the proper direction. Sure. That's also going to give you an impact area that you're trying to strike the golf ball as well, okay. almost like a sweet spot. Right. Right. So when we get set up, we want to make yep. sure we've got the lines of that putter lined up in the direction we want to go. Okay. This putt's going to be pretty darn straight. Yep. And our goal is going to be to see if I can follow through continuously straight in that direction. Right. Okay. So just try to keep it straight, follow through that line, line up with the hole. Yes. There we go. High Thank five. you so much. There you go. <laughs> well done. Now that's how you do it. Well, I may not be ready to go pro yet, but by golfing on PEI, I was able to enjoy an activity that the islands become known for. There was still another maritime venture I had on my list, and I met up with Captain Perry on his converted lobster fishing boat to help me complete it. Now, Perry, we're sitting on your boat in the beautiful Georgetown Harbor, the ships around us. What are we getting up to today? We're going to take you about eight kilometers out off the coast and we're going to get you right in the water digging uh, giant bar clams on an island that my father and my grandfather were actually, they, they grew up on. How did you get into clam uh, digging and, and, and uh, uh, being a captain of a vessel that goes around and does all this fishing? Yeah, um, I was a lobster fisherman most of my life, like my father and my grandfather. And um, when people came home from Ontario, mostly Ontario and Boston, um, the first thing they'd want to do is they'd want to go down to the island to dig clams. 
So when I started thinking about starting a small business, it was, well, why, why don't we do what we always did in the past? It's, it's just a, a special thing when you can take people out to a, an island out off the coast of PEI and, and just let them be kids again. Even older people, the youth comes right out in them. I don't mind letting loose my inner child. So I was happy to get going and hit the water to check out some of the educational traps. We anchored and Captain Perry hauled out a large circular trap. Okay, this here is our rock crab trap. Okay. Rock crabs are very tasty. I think yeah. they're better than lobster. Okay. But the only thing is you don't get a lot of meat out of them. Yes. Yeah. Do you want to hold one? Uh, sure. Before I, I knew it, I was holding a live yeah. rock crab. Like Carefully, okay. of course. Yeah. This guy's fascinating. You know, I just need to be wary not to get too close to those pincers. He's open, ready to <laughs> he's, champ he's, down. He's looking to give you a little bit of, a, of a, a bite there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Both the crab and I breathed a sigh of relief as we moved on to the lobster trap, where the captain displayed a small variety of different lobsters. Now, I mean, obviously we got a few different sized lobsters yes. here. It's like the, the female and the male, they gotta be what, like, Two feet long, I, w I would say. Uh, uh, once you stretch them out, I yeah. guess they might be close to it. Yeah. They're about four, four and a quarter pounds. Yeah. After returning the animals to the water, it was time to get clamming. We put on our wetsuits and boarded a smaller boat that took us to the shore of a nearby island. The captain was joined by Art, a fellow crew member, as they ventured into the chest high water. Armed with a clam rake, I joined them with my mask and snorkel on. Dipping under the water, I looked for what Perry described as small belly buttons in the sand and managed to actually dig up a few clams. After finding some more, we climbed out and went to the shore to cook them up. So I got the meat and the juice. Yeah, take a little sip and eat some clam. Okay. Wow. <laughs> wow, I mean... Talk about flavor. Oh, there's lots of flavor. Salty, too. sweet. Yeah. So fresh. Yeah. I'm never gonna have clams like this again. I mean, this is this is the best you can possibly do. You literally take them out of the water, bring them in, cook them, and enjoy them. These are what we call fresh clams. Yeah. <laughs> As I stood there, enjoying the seafood with the captain, I felt like I had had the full PEI experience. Well, not quite. I made one last quick stop at the famous Anna Green Gable store and donned Anne's famous red locks. The character in the internationally best-selling book by Lucy Maud Montgomery draws tourists to small province from all over the world. They might come for Anne, but after meeting the friendly folks, walking the incredible beaches, and eating the fantastic seafood, PEI becomes a destination to remember with many returning again and again. It's a place that evokes a feeling of serenity and joy. And as I left the red sandy shores, I began to count down the days until I could return once more. Host, Alex Smythe. Producers, Emma Tandon and Alex Smythe. Field producer, Wendy Purvis. Videographer and editor, Sergio Barra Barahona. Media Accessibility Specialist, Ron Rickford. Audio Post, Mike Monson. Graphics, Mike Smith. Senior Producer, Michelle Dudas. President and CEO, David Arrington. Copyright 2022, Accessible Media Inc.